Well, good morning, good morning, and welcome back to another Bible Coffee. It's wonderful to be with you all this morning. I'm Travis. And I'm Megan. I'm trying to take a drink of her coffee, but I won't I let know, her. I know, I was trying. So today we are <laughs> digging into chapter 18 of Genesis, where we are in the next step of the Abraham saga. So why don't we just jump in and see what this is all about? Sounds like a plan. All right. Please remember that I will be reading from the column on the right, which is the JPS Tanakh translation. The column on the left is the NRSV translation. You are welcome to follow along with either side or with your Bibles at home or just listen as we read. Genesis 18. The Lord appeared to Abraham by the terebinths of Mamre. He was sitting at the entrance of the tent as the day grew hot. Looking up, he saw three men standing near him. As soon as he saw them, he ran from the entrance of the tent to greet them, and bowing to the ground, he said, My lords, if it please you, do not go past your servant. Let a little water be brought. Bathe your feet. Recline under the tree. And let me fetch a morsel of bread that you may refresh yourselves. Then go on, seeing that you have come your servant's way. They replied, Do as you've said. Abraham hastened into the tent to Sarah and said, Quick, three says of choice flour, knead and make cakes. Then Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf, tender and choice, gave it to the servant boy who hastened to prepare it. He took curds and milk and the calf that had been prepared and set these before them. And he waited on them under the tree as they ate. They said to him, Where is your wife Sarah? And he replied, There in the tent. Then one said, I will return to you next year, and your wife Sarah shall have a son. Sarah was listening at the entrance of the tent which was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in years. Sarah had stopped having the periods of women, and Sarah laughed to herself, saying, Now that I'm withered, am I to have enjoyment with my husband so old? Then the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I in truth bear a child old as I am? Is anything too wondrous for the Lord? I will return to you at the same season next year, and Sarah will have a son. Sarah lied, saying, I did not laugh, for she was frightened. But he replied, You did laugh. The grass withers. The flower fades, but the word of the Lord lives forever, and this is the word of the Lord. All thanks be to God. Mm-mm-mm. All right. She got caught. She got caught lying to God. <laughs> got caught lying to God, huh? Yeah. Tell you what. So um, next time I'm like, did you laugh, Megan? Better not lie about it. You know I wouldn't. I'd be like, yes, <laughs> yes, I did. <laughs> yeah, you, you, would, you would just tell me straight on. <laughs> yep, that is correct. <laughs> Be a little too proud of it, wouldn't you? <laughs> yes, I would. <laughs> oh, okay. mm. so, well, what do you think of this story, my dear? I thought it was very interesting on how, how hospitable Abraham was. Like, I mean, he was like, got the young calf, he got the milk, she was going in and she was baking cakes. And I mean, he had this whole spread and he sat out there with them and, you know, kind of entertained. It's like, what made him do that? Like, what made him react that way to them in general? That, that's a good question. Hospitality. Amen to that. I think that's, that's the uh, big thing we're supposed to catch on. What do you think about this extravagant hospitality of Abraham? I mean, we don't know why he was so inspired to do it other than he was just a good good person and a person of the Lord. But what do you think about that hospitality that he gave? I think it was he it was like a little one of those little pushes you get from God. Like we I get them. You know, and I think it was one of those things where he felt the need to do that and be so hospitable. But I think it was God leading him in that direction because then you get to the point of where, you know, the comments made about Sarah having a child 
Hey, you know, she's like, I'm old, you know, I've already been through the women's stuff, not gonna happen. Ha ha ha. Mm-hmm. And from behind, thought she was alone and nobody heard her laughing. Right. Yeah. <laughs> behind closed doors. God yeah. always sees you still. <laughs> And as you're talking, it it just made me think uh, about he was in the middle of of welcoming these guys, these strangers, these three strangers who showed up out of nowhere. We know from the story that they're angels, but how do you know that at the time? I I don't think Abraham knew that they were angels from the start, but maybe he did, because when they mentioned Sarah and uh, he brought up the mentioning Sarah and they already knew her name. Where is your wife, Sarah? How do you know my wife's name? Get out of here. You're freaking me out. <laughs> <laughs> that is, I mean, yeah, that's true. Maybe he knew they were angels or maybe he just didn't second guess them already knowing Sarah's name. I would have just found that a little bit creepy unless it was somebody that you had known from the past or something. But who's to say also that he only did it that one time? Who's to say that that's not how he greeted other people? I mean, he followed in the Lord's footsteps and listened to what God had to say and how, you know, God tells you to treat one another. So who's to say that he, they truly just didn't react that way with what they have, you know, at that time to provide and greet people and welcome people. It reminds me, I always go back to, to my grandparents and the story is about my grandparents um, on my dad's side because they lived, you know, out in the country, kind of like in a farm area, and you hear about people getting flat tires and them helping them out, and they were always just there for other people and always just very hospitable. I mean, you always felt welcomed any time that you, you know, visited, or and that was a lot of people around them. So, I think that's something that we get away from a little bit in you know more confined areas like city areas. Um, and you know the trust <laughs> with one another, and somebody coming to your door and asking for help. Um, these these times just it's a little scary. You know, was it as scary back then? Yeah, that that's a good question. And uh, of course, we are a little more hesitant to trust people in the city because we know there's just more scammers and things around in the city. In the country, folks are a little more trusting. A lot of times still leave the doors unlocked, even in this day and age. Mm-hmm. Uh, and how it was back then, you know, it's we, we tend to think that today is so much worse than back then. But you can think of examples of back then why it was not safe to just welcome people. Uh, they didn't even have the like, laws that we have now. now. Mm-hmm. Or police, you know, they didn't have that kind of setup. You oh, know, yeah. any nope. kind of like protection. Yeah, they they were out of luck if they were in trouble. Uh, and and in the scripture, you know, it's like even way back. Uh, you can go back to Psalm twenty three. Everybody's favorite Psalm: "The Lord is my shepherd; I shall not want." And in there, it mentions, "And even when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death," and that is an actual place in Israel, a very rocky pass that people would have to pass through to get from one place to another. It was well known in the region and be, and that was called the Valley of the Shadow of Death because it was a place well known where there would be robbers and murderers hiding out, waiting, waiting for you to pass by. They jump you, kill you, steal your stuff, do whatever. Uh, and so it was very dangerous times still there. It's not but like they, it's more We dangerous. have neighborhoods. Yeah, we have da- we have those neighborhoods around here. You know, just in general, in Indianapolis, wherever you go, there's there's one of those uh, <laughs> one of those neighborhoods. You have to pray when you go through if you go through them. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. I remember taking a, a wrong turn uh, into a, uh, the wrong neighborhood down in Miami, and and um, I was very out of place, and I was having rocks thrown at me by the the people in the neighborhood uh, as a clear sign to get out of their neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but yeah, sometimes you pass through the wrong neighborhoods. But even in the good neighborhoods, some we still have stuff happen in the suburbs around Indianapolis. Well, yeah, we we still have stuff happen. But a correlation with what you were talking about, the valley and how you know, dangerous it was. I mean, that that's kind of like neighborhoods that we have today, and like certain areas that we have today. 
yeah, in place to not pass through. But just just knowing there's people out there, it's like why you don't let the random stranger in your car. Uh, yeah, the, you don't just pick up people on the side of the road anymore, right? And most people don't want to get in the car with those people. So you just compromise. You don't worry about getting in. You go ahead and walk. I'm going to keep driving. <laughs> but you still see people hitchhiking out there and, yeah, and yeah. thousands of people pass by them. Um, but, you know, it's the same kind of thing. You don't know this stranger. You don't know what they're going to do to you. And that's always been the case. So I, I'm, yeah. I just don't think it's more dangerous today than it was then. I think it's dangerous today in well, different yeah. ways. Um, but yeah, it was. Uh, it I was don't disagree tough. with that. I mean, because they could get away with a lot more than what you can get away with now. And and plus, ta- yeah, because just don't have the authority nearby. Uh, the the thing about um, you know, with your grandparents, like they're such a good example of being hospitable watching out for people in need and and going to the extreme like you mentioned your grandparents started the um the uh, emt service in uh, in valor uh up there in that part of indiana there was never an emt uh, ambulance service before they started that and that's just for the people there talk about a, a way to be hospitable to the community to provide this health care service for them uh, yeah, so, well, and it was also, you know, my, yeah. my grandmother was very sick and she had a lot of asthma and, and, you know, if it's a need for her, they were the type of people that, yeah, they're going to get that need taken care of, but they also think about others because there's other people around them. And so that's a key. We think about how we want to be treated. And of course, we want somebody to be hospitable to us when we are in need and, you know, we need somebody to do that. So my, about your, your grandparents, so the people of faith, uh, and do you think that their faith and the teachings of the faith about hospitality played some role in how good they were about that? Yeah. I mean, from my perspective and being around them, they always back their words up with actions. And that's just who they were. And that's why I loved and, you know, I love and respected them so much when they were around because you could just see it, even with each other mm-hmm. and, and the family and, every, you know, and everybody. It was never, you know, um, empty words or empty actions with words. Mm-hmm. I don't know how to phrase that. Yeah. 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 And, and something that's, you know, because for us as people of faith in these day of age, we, we, we have thousands of years of teachings about to be hospitable. The Old Testament teaches us to be hospitable. The New Testament, Jesus teaches us to be um, hospitable. So we have these very specific teachings. But in Abraham's time, he didn't have all those specific teachings about hospitality. It's very important to God, but this is kind of like the beginnings of us learning how important hospitality is. Uh, not the very first time we're clued in to think about it, but but it's the first time it's really zeroed in as the important issue. And Abraham didn't have earlier teachings about hospitality, but he knew he was supposed to be righteous and just. And that, it seems, you know, we got very few instructions for him on how to be uh, a good person of faith, except to be right and just, you know, listen to God, uh, period. And whatever he was gaining led him to be so so hospitable to the extreme. Well, and and I kind of challenge that a little bit, because the more I've had to think about these stories and like the text and who Abraham was... Mm -hmm. It, there always has to be somebody who makes a mistake in order for us to learn from it, to know the difference of right or wrong, to understand what the ramifications can be by making that wrong decision. And if individuals like that weren't alive and didn't exist, then these kind of um, learning teachings I don't think would have necessarily been so deep because you, you make it a personal thing. It's about the family and it's about choices that he's made, like with his wife, Sarai at the time or Sarah and how she married the Pharaoh, like all these things have over a course of time become what he is today. So he, he would never be who he was today 
if he hadn't gone through the, you know, that kind of journey in his life. Okay, so kind of learning by experience then. Yeah, and, and that helps us learn to know that this is this is not a, a, the right thing to do. For Sarah to have Hagar have the child, obviously that causes issues. I mean, these things that happen, these magnificent things that have happened, but all, you know, through the journey, there have been maybe choices made that we wouldn't make today, and we've had to learn from those. Mm-hmm. So by sharing the story and this experience helps us to make better decisions in our lives. Yeah, and that, that's a good, really good point, because he would have been thinking about hospitality in terms of when they went to Egypt, and he was worried about dying there. And when they sent out Hagar and Ishmael, and he was distressed over Ishmael especially and uh, what was going to happen to them out there, and who were they going to run into? How are they going to be treated? Were they going to be treated with hospitality? So, yeah, you, you, that's a really good point. You, just the experience that he had in the story says a lot about why you know, he could have been so hospitable in this passage. Well, and if you think about it, even today's tradition of being hospitable to people, you have somebody over or somebody comes and visits, you usually have, you know, something for them to drink, whether it's soda, water, you you have like, clean dishes, <laughs> you have uh, maybe a snack or something for them to eat. I mean, food is actually, actually and eating is a way to celebrate in become a community with one another many traditions and cultures cultures and it's very similar to this thank goodness he did yeah and and maybe that's what a lot of our thank goodness culture... for you you get food out of it huh? that's right because you i what. know you're not making it <laughs> you're not the one making it <laughs> you're the one eating it <laughs> in between my wife and and church like i get mm-hmm. well um, hospitality. Uh, yeah. And uh, thank goodness my wife has some hospitality for me. Um, and and what the, the church does, too, and <laughs> what we do as families. That's, I know. We, we learn the hospitality because it's that important. But sometimes we uh, question whether we should or not. And because of our need to protect ourselves, sometimes we turn away people who might be in need themselves and not trying to scam us. And so we're always walking this balance of, of how can we be hospitable as we're called to be, but also not be doormats and stupid, just asking for trouble. That's hard. That's very hard. Because, you know, some people want to help all the time. Yeah. And other people are just pulling the strings. Well, maybe that that's something to uh, pray about and continue thinking about. Uh, and you know what, when, uh, God tells us that we should be hospitable, maybe we can take a lesson from Sarah on this and not just laugh at God for saying something that sounds so ridiculous at times, uh, and take God a little more seriously. Um, I don't know. Something to think about, something to pray about, but it's important, been important forever and still just as important today been dangerous forever is just as dangerous today but god calls us to do it because people need it and in abraham's case it ended up meeting angels sometimes when we're hospitable we welcome angels into our midst uh, who give us some leading directly from god i don't know i will not open my door unless you (laughs) say you're an angel (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Who would have thought a lesson on hospitality would be so complicated? <laughs> uh, I know, right? Uh, well, thank you so, so very much. I appreciate it. I love having my coffee with you in the morning. Love sharing this time together. I know. It's and, fun. Uh, Being able to talk about this, too. Because I've changed my, my opinion a little bit on Abraham. <laughs> oh, good. Good. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, Abraham's something else. He, he's not an easy person to, to always look up to, but he's definitely a person to look up to. He does some yeah, incredible yeah. things. Uh, and he walks with the Lord uh, like no one else had before him. And I don't know, like uh, like anyone else since, except the greatest of the prophets and Jesus himself. Who knows? 
Um, but well, thank you all. Thank you, Megan. Thank you all at home. Yeah, and yeah. remember to join us on Thursday because we will have a, another picture for you. Hey, and um, yeah, look forward to seeing you then. So thank you all. God bless you. See you on Thursday. Mm -hmm. Have a nice day. Have a nice day.